Welcome Soundies to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 5th of August 2023. It's good to have you all here. Um, looks like we've got people joining in from all over the world. Uh, so welcome to everybody. I'm operating solo today. Uh, Danny's got a schedule that made it so she couldn't be here, but um, we are going to cover some interesting things. So let's go ahead and switch on over to our agenda here and take a look at what we're going to cover today. Uh, first up, the Zoom F8n and the F8m Pro. Both, we're going to have an F8m Pro here that we're going to put on camera, but they're pretty pretty much the same. They're just a few minor differences if you want to record in 32-bit float. Um, but we're going to kind of talk through some of the most common questions I've received, and then if any of you have comments or questions in the chat, we'll definitely take a look there and see what we've got going there. And then, of course, we have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. So let's jump right on in. Just like last week when we talked about the same set here of questions, we're going to do the same with the F8n and the F8n Pro. And honestly, this also applies to an original F8 if that's what you've got uh, that, you're, that you're working with. So let's go ahead and switch to the overhead camera and talk first about the knob function and see how we can change that in different ways. But before, well, actually, before we do that, let me just kind of give an overview here. Uh, main encoder knob is right here. And that allows you to choose what you do. So you can change the screens. You can go to different metering views. Um, you can, there's also this screen right here, which allows you to control the outputs, both the main outputs and the 3.5 millimeter sub output. Um, we'll scroll back and here's kind of the main screen, the home screen, if you will. So those are the, that's kind of the first thing. Headphone volume right here, menu button right there. We have a slider switch here that does a couple of things. It will send tone to all of the channels to how you have it configured. In this case, minus 20, one kilohertz tone at minus 20. So if you're calibrating the levels, uh, so you have the outputs here connected to a camera or something like that, um, you can send tone and that way you can set the levels on your camera just to make them uh, consistent with the recorder mixer. So that's how you do tone, and we turn that off there. All right, then of course you have a, uh, a button to enter the channel menu for each channel. So we can come in, or actually that's to, to uh, enable it right there or disable it. And here is how you get into the channel menu, the little PFL button or pre-fader listen button. That allows you to change all the different settings for that input. And in essence, this button up here um, then with a number on it, that allows you to arm or disarm that channel. So if it's armed, when you press record, it will record. If it's disarmed, it will not record. And that, there's actually a nuance to that. It will record. So we're going to talk a little bit about recording isolated channels versus a stereo mix or both. If you have it disarmed, but you actually are sending audio through it into the stereo mix and you're recording the stereo mix, you will still capture it. You just won't capture the isolated channel itself, separated from all the others. So that's what arming and disarming does. Of course, our transport buttons along the bottom here over on the right is a power button. We have our record, play, pause, stop, um, go back and go forward buttons here. So that's uh, kind of a view there. And then, of course, the main screen here. Not a touch screen, um, but it is actually quite, I think it's about the right size. They've done an, I think I prefer this size screen over the MixPre screen, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I wish the MixPre would have a screen about this size as well. But uh, that's an overview there. Of course, the inputs are on the left-hand side of the unit, outputs on the right-hand side. So on the output, um, well, technically, there are four microphone combination line inputs on each side. Then we have the outputs, the sub-out 3.5 millimeter here the headphone output, the two main outputs over here. On this side, we also have the Hiroshi power input on this side. And the SD cards uh, slots are on this, this side as well, just above the inputs. All right, so there's an overall view of that. Now, what do these knobs do here for each channel? Well, you can actually define what they do. On a traditional mixer, you would have a separate control for gain or what on the zoom is called trim. And then 
uh, these would be faders. So let's go ahead and hop into the menu here. We'll come down to the system menu. And in the system menu, there's this option called track knob option. You have to scroll down a little bit here. But when we get to track knob option, we can choose what these knobs actually do. They can be a trim, which means your gain or amplification. They can be a fader. And we'll show you when you set it to fader, how you can actually still access the gain or trim. And then you can also set it up as a mixer. Um, so a couple of different options there. So let's go ahead and change it to trim. I think fader is the default. We'll change it to trim and show you what that looks like. So now you can see the UI has changed a little bit. And so what you'll notice here is now when I grab this and turn it, you can show, see here in red, it's showing me my amplification level or my trim level or gain level. So as I crank that up, you can see obviously we're getting way more level on that microphone. If I pull it down, um, we're changing that. So that's if you put it into gain or trim mode, that's what you get. Now you can still use the main encoder here and switch on over to the fader and you can still control the fader. So again, the fader is how much of this audio, this channel is sent to the stereo mix. And normally you leave that at zero. So it sends uh, it sends the entire signal to the, to the stereo mix, or you can decrease the amount it sets to the, to the stereo mix. So that's what a mixer, a traditional mixer does. You set the gain levels, which is the amount of amplification, and then you choose how much of that channel gets sent to the overall mix. And you can actually boost it a little bit more with the fader as well. Actually quite a bit more, 24 dB more, in fact. Normally we'd leave that at zero, which is called unity. And that's how trim mode works. Now going back into the menu, back into system, back into track knob option. Let's show you the fader mode. This is, I believe, the default mode. All right, now, when you're in this mode, this knob is a fader. All, all of these eight knobs are faders. So you can see here as I change this, you can see right there in gray, it's, it's actually hard to see, really hard to see. There we go, we're fading down. There's actually a minus there. Yeah, we may be overexposed. I'm gonna change the exposure just a touch here. Give me one second. And apologies, I'm going to, um, <laughs> we're going to go back to the, we'll go back here so that you don't have to watch the shaking camera while I change this. And let's just drop it a little bit there. Let's see what that does for us. Okay, switching back to the overhead camera. Can you see it better now? If I change this, yeah, a little bit better. So it's now a fader. This this knob here is the fader. And I want to put that at zero. I want it at unity. It's very sensitive. There we go. Now, if I wanted to get in and set the trim or the gain, I would just use this main encoder knob to choose which channel I want to change the gain for. Press in. And now I can change the gain level for this channel uh, to wherever I need it. So we're going to go ahead and put it right uh, about 55 dB of gain. There we are. So that is fader mode. That's the default mode. And then there's one other mode that they call mixer. Let's try that out and you can see what that looks like. So again, it changes the user interface. And these knobs right here, again, become faders. So this is if you're doing some heavy duty mixing, you've already got your gain or trim levels set up. And what this allows you to do is uh, to mix, to really kind of craft the overall mix itself. So that's what that does. And then that's all that does. So period. <laughs> if you want to set the trim for an individual input, you have to come into the pre-fader listen menu for that and actually come down to trim and adjust it there. So that's how that works. Typically, um, I usually leave it in the fader mode, but you can put it in whatever mode makes the most sense for you. All three options are valid options and uh, just do what, what works best for you. All right, so that's the knob option, our knob function. Let's go ahead and take a look at headphone presets. All right, um, back to the overhead camera. So 
For headphone presets, it's kind of buried in the menus, but there is a quick way to get there. Um, and let me just show you the quick way, and then we'll go and show you in the menus. The quick way is to hold down the stop button right here and press the number 7. And that gets you directly to the headphone routing or routing menu. And then you can see down here we have our different headphone presets. We're working on setting number 1 here. And I can scroll through the settings. I got up to 10 of them, 10 different presets. And so what we can do here is this is just like on the mix pre, you can choose what you hear in your mix. And so here, for example, we have it set up so that we're going to hear on the top row is the left, what you're going to hear in your left ear cup on your headphones. And the bottom row is what you're going to hear in the right ear on your headphones. And for this particular one, which is the default, we're just going to hear the stereo mix. We're going to hear the left mix in our left ear and the right mix in our right ear. That's what the little red uh, in the boxes represent. Now, if I had a situation where I was not recording a mix and I was just recording, say, three isolated channels, the, three, the first three channels, I could come in here and just choose to monitor these. So I could come in and press that. Well, what's going on here? There we go. And I get two options. I can listen to it post-fader or pre-fader. I go here. See how it's a blue? It's, well, yeah, you can see it okay there. Um, that allows me to listen to it pre-fader. So it doesn't matter what the fader setting is for that input channel. I'm going to hear it at its normal gain or trim level. The fader is not going to make a difference into what I hear in my headphones. If I wanted to hear what it sounds like after the fader, I'd make sure to put a red box there. So right now what I'm doing is I'm listening to inputs number one, two, and three in my left ear, and I'm listening to the right stereo mix on my right ear. What I would probably do more realistically here is I would listen to all three of them post fader in both ears like that. So that'd be a much more common thing. Now, if I have my boom mic on channel one, and it's actually my right ear that's a little bit, honestly, more sensitive. I can hear, or in other words, I can hear a little bit better out of my right ear. I might want to hear the boom microphone in my right ear and the lavaliers on channels two and three in my left ear. And that's how I would set that up here. Now, if I just want to switch to a different headphones preset, I could just press these buttons here to move forward and back. So setting number one is my custom setup. Setting number two is um, can also be a custom setup, but it's currently at the default settings of just hearing the left mix out of the left ear, right mix out of the right ear. And again, to get to this quickly, um, actually, we didn't show that. Let's go ahead and show that. I come into the main menu, and we're going to go to output, headphone, headphone routing, and that'll get us into that same exact screen. And again, Popping back out, if I hold it, the press, hold and press the the stop button and press the number seven, that'll get me directly there. So if I want to quickly change my headphone preset, I can do it just like that, and then pop back out. So one one of the questions that we had come in last week was someone was recording just isolated channels, and then when they went to go play it back, when they were wearing their headphones, they didn't hear anything, and they were wondering why am I not hearing anything? Well, they were using a headphone preset that was monitoring the left and right mix and because they didn't record a left and right mix they didn't hear anything when they played the file back so they had to create a custom headphone preset something like um, ours right here so playing back the isolated channels in the left and right ears okay so that's headphone presets let's pop back over here and see what's next um, how do you record the mix the isolated channels or both. Let's go ahead and cover that as well. So we'll come back out to the main screen here. Um, what I want to do is I come into the menu and we're going to go to the record menu or the rec menu. All right, the first two options are what we're concerned with. So we have two SD cards and the, the beauty of the Zoom F8 and the F8N Pro and the F8N is that you can record different things or the same thing to both SD cards. So in essence, you have a backup if you want a backup, or if you want to record different things to each card, you can do that as well. Let's just look at the options in each of them. First of all, 
You can choose to record nothing to that particular SD card if that's what you want to do. Uh, you can record tracks one through eight. So those are isolated tracks and it'll put it all in one polywave file. So each track that you're recording that's armed will be recorded on a channel within a larger wave file. That's how that works. In a, if on the other hand, I want to record each of the isolated channels in their own, you know, independently, not, not a mix, but the independent isolated channels, and I want to put each of them in a separate file, I don't want them all in the same wave file, you choose this one here, track one through eight, mono stereo wave. And what that means is if you have a set of two channels that are stereo linked, those will go in one file. If you don't have, uh, if you have a channel that's not linked to another channel, it'll get its own file. So that's what this means right here. And that's how you can get those in separate files. Sometimes people want them in separate files. I don't usually do that. I find it more difficult to go and um, it's easier to lose things and it's more files to name. But um, some people prefer to work that way. And that's perfectly legitimate as well. All right, the next one is if I also want to record that left and right mix plus all of the isolated channels, I choose this option and the others and, and the rest of it's the same. If I want the left and right mix plus the isolated channels one through eight, all on separate channels within the same wave file, I choose this one right here. And if I want the same thing, I want the left and right mix recorded to one file and I want each independent channel or isolated channel recorded to its own file, I would choose that option right there. And of course, if you just want the left and right stereo mix, you can record that and nothing else. Or if you wanted to record an MP3, now MP3, you can only record to a stereo mix. You cannot record isolated channels to MP3. And in these days, I'm not sure, there are, there are uh, some people that sometimes need to really, really save space for whatever reason on a turnaround. And so you've got the MP3 option. At this point, it'd be nice if you could get an AAC option, but um, it doesn't appear that Zoom supports that. So that's how you record a mix, isolated channels, um, or both, if you wanted to do that. All right, next up, uh, let's talk about outputs. Uh, you do on the Zoom F8N Pro, you have two mini XLR left and right outputs over here on the right-hand side, plus you have a 3.5 millimeter stereo sub out. So if I need to send an unbalanced uh, feed from the from the mixer here over to a camera, for example, that only has a 3.5 millimeter input, I could do that using the sub out. On the other hand, if I'm gonna send audio to a camera or yeah, say a camera that has XLR balanced inputs, I can use the left and right um, mini XLRs. We'll probably need adapters to get those into most cameras, uh, but that those are available to you. In terms of setting them up, there are a couple of things. Number one, if, you, if, you, if you're on the main screen here and you use the encoder just to scroll to the right, you get some, um, some options right here to control it directly from the screen. So I can turn these inputs on or off right here from the screen. And again, it's just using the encoder. One thing to note, um, when you turn the outputs on, it is gonna use more power. So if you're trying, if you're not using them and you're trying to conserve power, it's best to turn them off if you can. Um, it also gives you the option of what uh, level of output you want, whether line or normal. Um, so you've got those options as well. Normally I would, if I'm choosing, if I'm sending to a camera that can be switched to line level, I'd choose line. And then you have an output limiter as well, which you can turn on or off. And that's just to prevent any overloads from making it out of the mixer into the camera or whatever else is downstream. And then, of course, you have the same settings for the sub out, the 3.5 millimeter output. Currently, that limiter is on. So again, if you're trying to conserve power, I'd turn those off, but that's how you, you can adjust those there. You can also come into the output menu and control them here to some extent. Yeah, so you can turn the outputs on and off right here. You can do them all at once or you can turn them on or off independently and then you can choose the output level here so when it says line and normal <laughs> what the line versus normal means is basically professional line level versus consumer line level is what they're referring to so most cameras where you can switch the line the input to line level you'll want to use the professional line level in most cases and it's normal on the sub out to use um 
to use consumer line level. So that's why the normal in that case is minus 10 dBV. And then you can also set it to mic level. So if you're going into a camera that cannot be switched to uh, line level, it's you say a consumer mirrorless hybrid camera, you can switch it to mic level and that'll put it down at a level where that input can handle the levels coming in. So that's how you control those there. You can also apply an output delay. So for example, if you're live streaming and you're sending audio to um, maybe an ATEM mini switcher and you need to delay the audio, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, apply that here. And it does it in frames. And I believe you define, yeah, you can define the frame rate, but that, that, that's where it allows you to um, apply that delay right there. We won't jump into all the details there, but that's how you do that. Okay, let's uh, see what we've got here. I think that was everything for that I wanted to cover there, except for questions. Let's come back and to the chat and see if there are any questions. If you have any questions about um, the F8N Pro specifically, or the F8N, or the F8, <laughs> uh, it's been through three iterations now, it's on its third. Um, go ahead and put those in the chat. And if you could tag me at Curtis Judd Audio, that'll make it a little easier for me to find. It looks like there's some chatter going on about Japan. Okay, Amos has a question. Please, how can I separate lapel audio from boom audio on F8 mixer? Okay, so I'm assuming you have the boom microphone, say on channel number one, and you have your lapel microphone or lava, excuse me, lavalier microphone on channel number two. Um, if you wanted to record them separately, uh, then I would just come to the record menu and make sure that you are recording like this. Either the first option here, uh, let's see, the first option here, or if you wanted to get the left and right mix also down at this option, but it sounds like you just want them separate. So I would probably choose this track one through eight, Polywave. If you want them in separate files, then you can choose track one through eight, Mono Stereo Wave. So that's how you can do that. In terms of the headphones, if you're trying to hear them independently, um, we covered that as well. Actually, I'm gonna do the shortcut. So press and hold stop, press seven, and then I can choose a preset where I can send, oh, you're not seeing any of this. <laughs> okay, need to switch, my, my, my apologies. Let me come back and show all that again. So Amos, here's the first answer to your first question. Uh, I've come into the record menu. On record to SD1, I would choose track one through eight, polywave. That's probably the option you want. Go ahead and try that, and that'll put the uh, boom microphone, if you have it in the channel number one, that'll put it on the first channel, and then any lapel or lavalier microphones that you have plugged in will come in on the subsequent channels. So that's how you do that. Okay. Looks like Ted and Wasabi are um, enjoying a little conversation about <laughs> Japan. Oh, Camille, thanks so much for the super chat. Very much appreciate that. Um, Alan, I thought these sessions were done on Sunday, not Saturday. It is Saturday today, right? <laughs> it is Saturday today, Alan. Uh, I had a little bit of a schedule conflict, so we're doing this week's on Saturday. We'll be back, back to Sunday starting next week, so... Um, not tomorrow, but the following Sunday. We'll be back on Sundays again. So yeah, just had to switch it up a little bit. And um, hello to everyone who's joined us since we first got started here. Rick, good to have you here. Um, Stanzi Entertainment, great to have you here from, uh, from Nigeria. Daniel's joining us from Valencia, good to have you here. Um, Ted says, very hot in Bulgaria, but uh, up on the mountain, it's very nice. And uh, Steve says, wish we could share our cool temperatures with you. I agree. Um, Mark, it uh, sounds pretty brutal in Texas right now. So hang in there. Um, come for a visit if you like. <laughs> it's much cooler here than it is there. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our, um, in the questions that we had submitted ahead of time. So I'll just pop back over here. And let's bring them up. First up is from David. 
My current recorder is a Zoom F8N Pro, and I've been doing some experiments with the Zoom MSH6 mid-side microphone along with Zoom's 3-meter extension cable. There is remarkably little information about this microphone and how to use it correctly with a Zoom F8N Pro. The volume knob on the microphone appears to adjust both the mid and side levels, which was unexpected. Even the microphone's orientation is not documented, though I have now labeled mine appropriately. Even if you don't have experience setting up the levels for this microphone, have you any experience of setting up mid-side microphones, and how would you do this for the Zoom F8M Pro, please? And here's a just a quick picture of the microphone that he's talking about and the extension cable. So he plugs this into his F8N Pro, and it's a mid-side microphone, meaning it has two different capsules in there, one of which is a cardioid, which you aim at the sound source, and then there's another one, which is a figure eight, that is actually capturing off to the sides in a mid-side configuration. And the, the, the benefit of a mid-side recording is that in post-production, you can actually adjust the stereo width. Um, and I don't, unfortunately, have any experience with this microphone. Um, I'm sorry about that, David. And I don't have um, a lot of experience with mid-side recording at all, to be honest, but um, I think it's perfectly normal. You, you typically would want to keep, I would think, the input levels consistent between the two, the mid and the side. And then it's in post that you adjust things to get your stereo width. So it sounds like you're probably doing it just fine. Um, I would probably go on YouTube and find a sort of general mid-side recording technique videos to get a little bit more input on that. But it sounds like you're probably actually headed down the exact right path. So curious to see what you come up with and best of wishes there. All right, Ted asks, can you please summarize use cases that support purchasing the Zoom F8 over the sound of, uh, I think you meant sound devices, Mix Pre 626, it's actually 6.2. Uh, whenever I get over about $800 for a field recorder, I always wonder if I should just save up for the Mix Pre. Um, well, I think the first question I think that one should ask when making that decision is, are you going to use it professionally or is this for a hobby? If it is for a hobby um, and you're self-funding, so you're paying for it out of your personal funds, um, first of all, we're not going to debt for anything if it's a, if it's a hobby or <laughs> a passion project. Um, so that'd be the first thing. Um, I, I would The thing is, is that the... If you need more inputs, I think, the and, and you're on a tight budget, the F8N Pro makes perfect sense. It's $1,100 versus the Mix Pre 6.2, which I believe is $900 and some dollars. The Mix Pre 6.2 has three XLR inputs plus a 3.5 millimeter input, whereas the Zoom F8, any of the F8 models have eight XLR inputs. And do they also have a 3.5? No, they do not have a 3.5 millimeter input. So they're kind of a different a different beast, if you will. Um, so that's the first thing. Are you doing it professionally or not? Here's the, and the, here's the reason I ask that. The, um, the companies that make these two products are very different. Uh, Zoom is a mass market consumer electronics company that serves primarily musicians, to be honest, uh, but they've also made their field recorders, which actually are quite excellent. They have the know-how to do it, and they've got the you know they've got the engineering expertise certainly to do it, and they make quality products. And in fact, in some regards, um, the F series of recorders. Well, I would say at least the F three F three is okay in terms of build quality. The F six and the F eight series are all uh, very very durable in terms of their build. But the but the trick is is this is that if one of these fail and you're outside of the warranty period. I don't know, and I've not heard from anyone yet that has confirmed this, but I think you're basically out of luck. Like that is a, it's ready for recycling at that point, um, unless you're a serious DIYer and you can open it up and, and actually fix whatever is broken. On the other hand, Sound Devices is a much more niche, much smaller company. Their primary market is serving production sound mixers with um, high-end recorders and mixers. And the Mix Pre is a relatively new uh, thing for them that they're they're reaching down into the prosumer market from where their kind of core business is. And um, I believe they do have repair services. So I've actually had my very first Mix Pre, I believe. I dropped it and one of the fader knobs broke, sent it in, they replaced it and sent it back. So 
it's a very different kind of experience. So that's kind of where the pro versus hobby comes in. Um, if you're a pro and something breaks, you need to get it fixed. Um, and you'd probably prefer not to have to buy a brand new recorder <laughs> or mixer that's approaching $1,000 or over $1,000. Um, so that's one consideration. There are a lot of little nuanced differences between them. The Mix Pre 2 Series approaches 32-bit float a little bit differently. You actually can control the gain on the Mix Pre. You cannot on the F8. Once you're in 32-bit float mode, there is no gain or trim setting. Um, there are benefits to both, I think. Um, I think the Zoom approach is a little bit simpler for people that don't really understand the ins and outs of engineering, audio engineering as much. Whereas with the sound devices, they get they their their general ethos is give the user the power, um, give them the settings they need to get what they want. Don't get in the way. So I think that's generally their ethos, and I think that carries down to a large extent to the Mix Pre series as well. So um, the you know if you're if you're going to spend one thousand one hundred dollars, um and you need balanced outputs, you're not going to get that from sound devices. You're going to have to go up to nearly $2,000 to get a Mix Pre 10 that has balanced outputs. So do you need balanced outputs, Ted? Another question. Um, so there's just a lot of trade-offs there. So those are kind of, the, the, I think the core one though is, um, do you, are you okay buying a device at this price from a consumer electronics company that once it gets past its warranty period is basically recyclable or throwaway at that point? Um, or do you want a company that will actually be able to repair it after that period? So those are kind of the, that's probably one of the bigger considerations. Differences in audio quality, people, that's a lot of people assume, okay, the sound devices are more expensive, they must sound better. And eh, between an F8N Pro and a Mix Pre, any model Mix Pre, there's a little bit difference. I feel like the Zoom, and you have to be listening to really good headphones with really good headphones to hear even the slightest difference, at least to my ears. They're not that different. Um, uh, if you want to be really, really picky about it, you could say that the Zoom F series sounds a little bit more neutral, I would say. Some people might call it clinical, um, whereas the Mix Pre does appear to have just the tiniest, tiniest bit of additional bass response in it. Um, in any case, I don't think it's a it's an automatic. So hopefully, Ted, that helps a little bit. All right, next up from Craig. Recently, I have been caught out and about without a recorder. A nice sound happened, and on, my only means of recording it was my phone. I generally only buy budget phones, and I'm well overdue for an upgrade. It got me thinking about which phone has the best built-in mic for fully general capture. Is there much difference between a low mid-range phone compared to the overpriced flagship handsets by Samsung or Apple, for instance. Well, Craig, um, first of all, you gave yourself away by asking this question and calling the... <laughs> if the Apple and the Samsung flagship phones are overpriced and you will never buy them, I don't. I wouldn't bother. Um, so those are non-options. I, I haven't lived in the Android uh, phone world, so I don't know. But what I can say is this... Um, let me just share a little something here. They're both use uh, basically all mobile phones are using MEMS microphones. And a MEM microphone, let's just show you here. Here's a Wikipedia article that talks about MEMS technology. And basically MEMS stands for, let's boost that in size here. It's a micro electromechanical system. And in the case of MEMS microphones, what we're talking about is it's basically a tiny, tiny, tiny microphone on a, basically a chip that also has processing on it. So it takes the audio and converts it right there on the that, that same unit into digital audio and then sends it off to the phones, the rest of its circuit board and, and processing and such, so on. So there are, um, there are probably millions of different MEMS microphones available for the manufacturers to choose from to put into their phones. And there are different arrays. I mean, they could choose to have multiple microphones and do some processing to make them sound cleaner maybe do some noise reduction so i i don't know um i i use it for better or worse uh apple has a lot of my money um <laughs> and they sound okay uh they're they're all right so i don't know if anyone has other uh specific input that 
uh, you know, that you have on specific phones, specific Android phones, especially the, the less expensive Android phones. If you could share those with Craig, that'd be super helpful. But if you're getting the results you want, Craig, then that's great. There are also a series of microphones you can buy that plug into phones with a USB-C input. So if you're really interested in doing field recording without carrying around a field recorder, but you would be willing to carry around an external microphone, that's another option you might consider as well. So hopefully that helps. Um, I know Rode makes one, but I think theirs is specifically for the iPhones. It has a lightning connector on it. They may have a USB-C version. You might check that. I believe that um, Shure has one as well. That's that's worth checking. Okay. All right, Florian asked a question in last week's sound for video session, actually several questions. In last week's sound for video session, you talked about switching off Bluetooth on the Mix Pre helps a lot in saving battery life. Um, it helps, I wouldn't say necessarily a lot, but it helps. So if you're being very battery, you know, power conscious because you need to power through a long day, then turning off whatever you don't need is generally a good idea. So Florian goes on to say, I was wondering if there are other aspects to this topic. So that is why I'm asking. I know, for example, that running noise assist or mix assist are draining the battery due to computing power. But do noise assist and mix assist draw roughly the same amount of power or do they draw different amounts? And are there other aspects to power saving like switching off the low cut filter or phantom power or will by, um, by enabling not switching to off tracks and buses draw more power and does arming them make any difference okay let's stop there um i think basically turning off anything that you don't need is a good idea not just from a power saving standpoint but also and well sh short version florian i don't know the answer to all those questions turning off phantom power typically will save battery um, i don't know the difference between noise assist and mix assist in terms of how much battery power they consume um, it's not the kind of thing that sound devices shares and it's and i haven't done any extensive testing to try and get to that um but yes turning off phantom power certainly makes a difference i whether it saves battery or not i would recommend uh disabling any channels that you clearly don't intend to use throughout a session so uh, just turning them off is is a fine idea so here for example let's go to the overhead again on the zoom f8n pro similar type thing on the mix pre if I wanted to come in here, um, this is input number two. I'm not currently using it. Looks like it's not even an option to turn it off. So I'm going to guess that on the, at least on the Zoom F series, that's not going to make a difference. Turning phantom power on or off for that channel could potentially make a difference. So I definitely would turn that off. I would disarm anything that you're not recording to as a matter of principle so that there's not as much confusion in post. Because if you arm something that you're not actually recording to, you're just going to get another channel in post that doesn't you're going to use it more sd card you're going to have you know this extra channel and if it's not you doing it processing it it could cause confusion for whoever is working on it like oh was there supposed to be something there because it looks like there's nothing there i have a channel but i have nothing on it so for those reasons alone it's a good idea to disable or disarm any channels that you aren't actually uh, using at that particular moment so Hopefully that makes sense. I didn't answer all your questions. I know that. I don't know if a low-cut filter makes a difference. I would not anticipate a big difference from using or not using a low-cut filter. Phantom power, I would expect a difference. So if you're not using a particular channel, I would definitely turn the phantom power off. Okay. What battery capacity do you suge uh, suggest using for a MixPre 10.2? And what do you suggest for a MixPre 6.2? Uh, well, it depends on how long you need to power them. Um, for my Mix Pre 3, I just use the uh, NPF or Sony L series battery sled, and it looks like this. So I've got a uh, battery on this side and a battery on this side. I like this because this allows me to hot swap. So I can pull one of them while we're in the middle of a recording if I need to and replace it with another battery. That's a nice thing there. I would also, if I do have to go through a longer day, and especially if I'm in a bag, or even if I'm on a table, if I've got a cart or a table, I would get a, a USB uh, battery bank, and I would power via that as well. So in that case, I have the the kind of medium size. I don't even know what the milliamp hour rating is for it, but something, you know, kind of a brick, <laughs> a brick-like thing if you really want to power through a long one. So that's what I would use there. On the MixPre 10.2, depending again on what you're doing, if you're in a bag and you have a power, a battery distribution system, then using the typical smart batteries, which I think are 98 
watt hour batteries. Um, I would have a few of those on hand if you're going to be powering through a day, for example, an entire production day. If that's going to be 12 hours, then I would have probably um, at least two of them on hand and be charging one while you're draining another. Um, so you can swap between them, but I would ideally have something like four so that I can, you know, as soon as one runs out, I can, I can pop on another one, get that first one in the charger and not have to worry about that probably for the rest of the day, but it's there, it's there and it will be recharged if I need it. Um, so there are, there are just a million different options there, but that's how I would typically approach it with a mix pre 10 to, or if you want to go the budget route for those, um, a single cine battery, that's actually what we're powering the F8M Pro with right now. It's a 150 watt hour um, cinema battery with a DTAP output. And I'm just using a DTAP to Hiroshi uh, cable to get that power into the Hiroshi input on the F8 or the Mix Pre 10 too. So, okay. Let's see. I think that was all the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So we'll pop back out to the chat and see what's going on in the chat. All right. All right, Osprey Media says, I know you've kind of answered this in previous video, but is it worth the spend to upgrade from the F8 to the F8N? Um, if the F8 is serving your needs, not really, from my point of view. Um, yeah, I would I would say no, unless the F8 is, unless there's some limitation that's bothering you that you're <laughs> that you're not able to solve. And the things that it solves is it uses a different, uh, This is, some people saw this as a regression actually going from the F8 to the F8N, is that the AA battery, there used to be these plastic sleds in the original F8, which you're familiar with. Uh, you could buy extras of those and have batteries already queued up and ready to go and just pop out the thing and pop in a new one. On the F8N and F8N Pro, it's just a big door you open and stick a bunch of batteries in. So. That's perhaps a less elegant design, but I think realistically on an F8 of any any of the F8s, uh, I see the AA batteries as kind of a bridge so you can hot swap um, your external batteries, honestly. Um, but that that's how I just, that's just how I personally view it. But if you're actually powering via those AA batteries, the, the original F8 may actually be an advantage for you. They introduced the hybrid advanced hybrid limiter with the F8N, but they also included a, um, a firmware update. So you can actually use that on the original F8, so you're not missing out there. And then the only other thing really that I can think of that was a difference was that on the original F8, if you wanted to bring in a line level signal, you had to use, you had to use a quarter inch TRS cable to bring that into the F8. That was how you told the F8, this is a line level signal as opposed to a microphone signal and uh, with the f8n you can actually switch in the menus to even if you're bringing in a, a line level on an xlr you can do that and just tell it hey this is line level so those are the main differences otherwise i'd just stick with your f8 and run that thing until you've gotten all your money's worth out of it <laughs> that's my take on it uh, Camerahead Studios, thanks for this live on the F8M Pro. I always think about going, um, getting this recorder over a Sound Devices Mix Pre. I have a Zoom F4. Can F8N Pro compete with the Mix Pre's? Of course. Of course it can. It's a different device, but it's audio quality wise. In fact, um, we actually just finished production this week at my work. Um, we did a, uh, we're putting together a, basically a corporate video where we have a bunch of executives talking. We have them all in different locations. So we had three of them, three or four of them in the studio that we have actually set up. And that's where we have our Sound Devices 833. And then we had a bunch of kind of um, talking head setups throughout the rest of the office. And rather than disconnect the 833 and move that all around and reconfigure it for each individual shoot, we, we needed to do a ton of these this week. Like it was a really busy week. Um, we pulled out our F8N and use that as our mobile one for all of the shots around the office outside of the studio. And they cut together beautifully. So it's not as if, audio quality wise, I don't think there's, uh, I wouldn't make my decision between the two solely based on audio quality because there's just such a little difference between them personally. I think it has more to do with the features that you specifically need and what fits your, fits your needs. So 
The Zoom F4, I wish they still made that too, by the way, except for with a better screen. <laughs> the screen wasn't very good. But aside from that, it's a fantastic recorder, fantastic audio quality. The feature set's really nice. It's really well built. Um, but again, I, it goes back, Camera Head Studios, to the same thing as that Ted was asking, which is if you're using it professionally, um, that's where I would I would absolutely have a backup if I'm using one of the I would absolutely have a backup no matter what you're using if you're doing it professionally, um, but especially with the zooms because if they're out of warranty, they're basically done. So those are some thoughts there. All right, Mark says my Mix Pre has been serviced by Sound Devices and they were excellent fixing the problem and getting the unit back to me quickly. A plus when using for paid work. Perfect example. Thanks for that, Mark. All right. Um, ba, 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 ba. Yep, Ted. Of course, I meant. Of course, you meant sound devices. Um, it's not for professional use, but for field recording. Won't the mix pre be lower noise? Not substantially. No. I, you're going to need to worry a lot more about your microphones than your recorder. If you're between the mix pre and the Zoom F series, uh, you need to worry a lot more about your microphones being the source of the noise as opposed to your recorders. They're both very clean preamplifiers, so no, I wouldn't worry about that. That's to me, that's a non-factor in making the decision. All right, Amos, thank you very much. Really appreciate your effort. And you really put a smile to my face today. I pray grace of Almighty God. We'll continue to speak for, uh, for you anywhere in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Amos, and best to you as well. And Cam Head Studios, looks like you answered my question with Ted's. I kind of did, <laughs> a little bit. Um, Ted also says, don't need balanced output. So Ted, I would say, uh, yeah, if it's not for professional work and you don't need balanced outputs, then maybe a Zoom F6 would be the one for you. It's less than $1,000. It's less than 800, in fact. So, all right. Uh, Yomi says, is there a way to name each track with a character's name? Yes, there is. Um, you can name each of the tracks and it saves it in metadata. And the way to do that is with the app. And I don't have, do I have an app I can show you here doing that? Let me just see if I can get that set up and running here. It may take me just a moment here. So I'm going to clean the screen so it doesn't look all greasy so you can actually see it. Just wiping that off a little bit. And let me go to the overhead camera and let's see if we can make this work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to turn on Bluetooth. And the way you do that is you have to, first of all, you have to install a separate, there's actually a separate thing you install. I don't understand why that is on the F8, or the F series actually. Um, but what I do is you press and hold the menu button and it asks you if you want to uh, connect Bluetooth. And we're gonna go ahead and choose yes. And then we get two options. We can use Bluetooth timecode or the F8 control. I'm gonna choose the F8 control. And then on my phone, I'm going to go, I'll put this up on the screen just a moment here. Um, here's the F8 control. And it says, oh, we found this. Let's go ahead and turn that on. So it's connecting. Okay, and you can see here, the first channel is already called, uh, this was clearly named by Emma. It's called Brap Brap. Um, don't ask what that means. <laughs> But yes, you can change them here. I'll have to see again how we change them. Don't remember if it was, a, no, it wasn't that. I think you come into the menus and apologies here. It's been some time since I set this up. So you have to give me just a bit. That looks like the regular, the same menus. It could be in metadata for next take. There's the scene name. Here are the track names. So I can name the track here. And this is where I actually go in and change that. And I can change it to whatever I want. So to answer your question, yes, you can. And that's a pretty neat feature, actually. You can change those names. And it saves it into metadata so that when you bring it into post, if your digital audio workstation recognizes the metadata, it will actually show the names of those tracks, which actually makes post-production a little bit easier. All right, David 
says, we converted in the 90s from analog to digital, still passing it over Cat6. What is the difference of mono and stereo of analog compared to digital? What's hi-fi in digital? Oh my, that's a... I'm not really sure how to answer that question, David. Let me just dig in a little bit. Let me think about that. I'm going to turn the Bluetooth off here since I don't need it anymore. By the way, let's just show that just so everyone can see that. So if I come in here and it turned the menu uh, button turns blue when you have Bluetooth enabled. So I'm just going to press and hold that and it'll ask me if I want to disconnect and I'll go ahead and say yes. So now Bluetooth is off and we're saving on power. All right, back to David's question. We, co we converted in the 90s from analog to digital. Still passing it over Cat6. What's the difference of mono and stereo analog compared to digital? Um... I'm not sure I understand. Well, the, the, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. But I think what you're, what one thing you might be getting at is that are you talking about quality? Um, so here, here's the first thing: transducers, whether microphone. A transducer just means you're transferring from one type of energy to another. So a transducer, for example, a microphone takes actual um, sound energy waves and converts them into an electrical wave that represents the sound wave. And then on the other end of the, the audio signal chain are speakers. Speakers are transducers as well. They take, um, ultimately they take an analog signal to move the cones and produce sound in a space. Now, digital audio, uh, the transducer's signal, which is an analog signal, an analog electrical signal will be converted into digital at some point. And then when it's played back, it has to go from that digital, convert back to analog, and then be played back through the speaker. So there are a lot of pieces in there. Um, if you're asking about quality, yeah, different. there are different quality trans uh, converters. They, they call them analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. They're, they range in quality. Some do really well, some do not so well. Just like they're higher quality headphones that sound better uh, or sound more accurate versus lower quality ones that uh, either are specifically tuned to, to sound exciting for a certain kind of music. Um, there are just a lot of different factors out there. Um, from my point of view, I don't, um, like I don't have a super strong, I, I, some people still like analog and I don't have an issue with that whatsoever. In fact, today we are using, um, our microphone of course is analog. It is a an Earthworks Ethos microphone. This is going into our Rupert Neve Design Shelford channel, which is a purely analog preamplifier, EQ, and compressor. That then gets sent over to our camera, at which point it comes into an XLR input, and it gets converted to digital. And then it goes out. Um, I won't cover the rest of the chain, but it goes out into the internet to what you're hearing, and on your device, it's taking that digital audio and converting it into analog and playing it back to you. So there are a lot of factors in that whole chain as to what the quality is. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, in any way, in any case, that those are some thoughts there. There are just a lot of... By the way, I will also say, just for context, it seems like there's a, uh, an inflection point for the quality on a lot of things. Once you, you spend beyond a certain point for either a microphone or a set of speakers or anything like that, there are increment, very small incremental benefits. Um, whereas down in the lower end of each of those markets, there's a wide variance in terms of quality. So it really depends on what you're doing and, and what you're aiming to achieve. So there's some thoughts. Uh, Wasabi used to use a USB power bank for the Mix Pre 6. It's a fine, fine choice. Um, <laughs> Daniel says, BNH says the Zoom F control is no is uh, no longer available. Actually, uh, thank you, Daniel. Is there something going to be replacing it? I don't know the answer to that question. Zoom doesn't tell me those things, so I don't know. But um, possibly, uh, it could be that it was just canceled. Um, unfortunately, the Zoom F4 was canceled. As far as it's been discontinued now for. 
think it was in 2020 or 2021 when they canceled it. So at least two years, maybe three years, coming up on three years, unfortunately. So I don't know if they're going to replace the F control either, Daniel. Not sure. Uh, Mark says, a bit off topic, but did you see the pre-release for Theos Digital Wireless um, with prices on their website? I did. Thank you for bringing that up. In fact, I've pre-ordered mine and uh, we'll be doing a review once we get it in and have an opportunity to work with it. So, um, Jurgen says, Curtis, you're too young to understand that question. That could be the case. <laughs> Um, hey, Curtis, would you say the Zoom F4 preamps still hold up in 2023? I would say yes, they absolutely do. No question in my mind. They're still they're still great. And it just breaks my heart that the Zoom F4 is no longer in production. Although, I'd love to have a Zoom F4N that had a better screen. That's the main thing. Um, <laughs> otherwise, fantastic recorder. All right. If you have any other questions, you want to drop them in the chat. We do have a few more minutes here. Um, just to kind of follow up, I do have, as I mentioned, the uh, a couple of things. Number one, we have a video coming out on the main channel tomorrow, which covers the Rode X Streamer X, specifically its audio features. So if that's of interest to you, that'll be coming out on the Curtis Judd channel on YouTube. Um, another update on the school at school.learnlightandsound.com, where we have all of our courses. Um, we did make an update to the Fairlight course. So for those of you that were waiting, we added a segment that covers how to round trip from Fairlight over into Isotope RX Audio Editor, finish your audio there, and then send it back to Fairlight. So if you're waiting for that particular segment, it's now there and available. Um, and that's just part of the course. So it's all there for you. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned to Mark's point here, the um, well, just a preview because it's the few that watch this channel. Not, this is a much smaller channel than my main channel, but um, like right now there, are, I think there are 47 or 48 of us here. <laughs> um, not tomorrow. So tomorrow is a streamer X review, but the next week we're gonna have a piece on 32-bit float versus 24-bit linear recordings. So if that is of something of interest to you, um, you might want to see that video. That'll be coming out again. What's the date there? Um, let me get the exact date for you. So if everything goes to plan on the 13th of August, you should see that video hit the main channel. So Emma and I are working on that. We've, we've already recorded the samples. So looking forward to that. All right. Uh, is there a decent bag for the F8 for under $200? Under $200. Well, let's see. I'm, I use mostly Orca bags. I very much appreciated Orca bags, but let's just see. Um, let's just come over here. I'm going to come to the Mac. Okay, so here is this. So you're gonna, I'm gonna move your your uh, your uh, question here. So we're looking for bags for the Zoom F8. Let's see if they recommend any here. Ah, here you go, Orca OR28. Um, so I use Orca bags. I've been very happy with them. Um, they're not for everybody, but that's one place to look. I have been super happy with mine. They have panels on the side that allow you to get into the sides, uh, like a, a thing that, like a little flap here that unzips um, to access, for example, everything on the side, including the XLR inputs or the outputs or whatever. They have a rain, kind of a vinyl rain fly, so you can put that over if you're working out in the rain. Um, the sides here also you can unzip and the whole thing folds down if you need to do that. So when you're setting up your bag, that makes it a lot easier. So those are some good things about that. Other companies that make um, sound bags, that are worth looking at that I've heard of for a long time. Here's another option for the Zoom F8 that's a much smaller. So if you're not planning on having any wireless receivers, this could be another option here. Um, the OR272. They also have a, a similar one for the Mix Pre series. Um, let's see here. We're looking for F8 in particular. Portabrace is another company to look at. 
Um, they're, they're a little bit more traditional. They use your covering the older devices. I don't know if they're still making those. I guess, I guess they are. Looks like they are still. Um, I believe K-Tech also has a series of bags. Let's see if they come. Yeah, here's the K-Tech Stingray. They have a series of bags. Um... You can find it different sizes. There are just a th thousands of them here, different sizes. Portabray seems to make them for specific devices in many cases. But anyway, there, there's where I would search. I've, I've been very happy with my Orca bags. So to answer your question there, Mike, um, you're good. All right. Um, Wasabi, thanks for subscribing to my courses. I appreciate that. Michael just purchased a Streamer X a couple of weeks ago. Hope that's working for you. Nicely there, Michael. On the F4 topic, do you know if it ever was compatible with another control device like the F control, something not Zoom made? No. As far as I'm aware, there's no other control surface available for any of the Zoom F series recorders, just the one that they made and is now discontinued. Um, oh, here's some input. Daniel uses an Orca OR30 for the F8M Pro, but it's a much more expensive bag. <laughs> it's a $350 bag. All right, friends, um, it is time to say, I hope you have a great week, that you are able to get out there and make some fantastic sound. Um, we will check in with you again next week. In the meantime, um, hope everything goes well for you. Talk to you soon.